Welcome back to our exploration of the digestive system. In this section, we're going to be learning about structures that are located in the head and um, kind of what they do. So we're going to start with, we have ingested the food and it's going to pass our lips and enter our oral cavity. Well, we've got muscles in our cheek, which are going to contract to try to keep the food um, between our teeth and not between our cheeks and our teeth like in chipmunks, because that's not going to help us very much. Um, we have our muscles of mastication, we have our facial muscles, all of those things helping us process the food. Um, the superior surface of our mouth anteriorly is the hard palate. Um, and then posteriorly, there's no more bone, so it's called the soft palate. And then we have this little thing that hangs down in the midline, and that is known as the uvula. And it serves a purpose we're going to learn about real soon. On the floor of the mouth, we have the tongue, which is attached on its undersurface through a structure known as the frenulum. So it's attached in the midline there as well. And all your oral cavity has the same epithelium, and this is a picture of the epithelium. So for now on the rest of the course, we're going to have epithelium on all these various organ systems, and you're going to have to look at pictures and figure out the epithelium for yourself. Um, and you can do this because you've already mastered this way back in the beginning of the course. And so I'm just going to point out right down here is where the basement membrane would be, and up here is where the surface is. So what you need to do is figure out, is it simple or is it stratified or is it pseudostratified? And, is, and if it's not simple, is the apical layer going to be squamous or is it going to be cuboidal or is it going to be columnar? And then you know what the epithelium is. Um, when we get to something that has transitional epithelium, I will point it out. So you can just take that out of your list of things that you're trying to figure out between now and then. Continuing on, we have the tongue, which has the same epithelium I just showed you, and it has muscles, which are going to be innervated by the 12th cranial nerve, the hypoglossal nerve. Uh, refreshing your memory, we already learned about the sense of taste and its three cranial nerves, and we learned about the four different types of papilla, three of which had taste buds. And we also learned about the five main senses. So just review this if you have forgotten any of it. Going to the sensor receptors, they are located in the taste buds and we have about 4,000 of these receptors in our oral cavity. And about three fourths of them are actually on the dorsal surface or the top surface of the tongue. But yes, we do have a scattering of a few of them um, on your palate or in your pharynx in the back of your throat area as well. So refresh yourself with the anatomy and um, what happens in the taste bud and how things work if you have forgotten any of this from your study of the special census. And then that moves us to the teeth. So the adult has 32 permanent teeth, which means if you divide 32 by 2, you have 16 on top and 16 on the bottom. And you have the same 16 both places. And in fact, you can divide through the mid sagittal line and you will have eight in each of these four quadrants. So, you know, the standing joke is sentence go to school for four years to learn about eight teeth. They learn more than, than just about eight teeth, though. So, there's only eight different teeth that we are going to learn about, and we are going to start in the midline. And the first two on the midline on each side are known as incisors. If you look at the top surface, it is very thin. So the tooth comes up just like a knife edge and it cuts. And these have a nice, simple, tapered triangular root. And the whole point of these is to bite and cut through stuff. And if you don't believe me, put your finger inside a one-year-old's mouth because their incisors have not been worn down from 20 years of eating hard things like carrots, like yours have and they can bite through your finger down to the bone pretty easily. So after the first two teeth, we are going to move lateral and posterior, and the next tooth in each of the four quadrants is pointy. And this is called a canine. It still has a, a single root, um, but the pointiness means that this is not meant for slicing and cutting through stuff, that this actually goes in and punctures and you just rip it. 
Okay, so just like when you give a toy to your dog and it like it rips the toy apart because it's using its canine tooth. Moving posterior to that, the next two teeth on each side are called the premolars, and as in the teeth before the, the molars. And these are kind of a hybrid tooth that has some characteristics of canine and some characteristics of molars. And these are the ones that students are most likely to label incorrectly. Because yes, it has the pointy, kind of like the canine, but the canine is a point in this direction. Whereas the premolar is, uh, is a point on one side, and when you look at the back side of it, it is sloped down. So it's not just like a mountain that can puncture into anything. And this one is going to be doing some crushing and not just ripping because it has that that back hidden behind the mountain in the front. And then your last three teeth in each quadrant, which either has two roots, one of which is quite big, or it has three roots, is called a molar. And it has a flat surface, not as in it's absolutely flat, there's little hills and valleys, but it, it's not a pointy surface and it's not a skinny little cutting surface. So, it's got a flat surface with little bumps in it, and that's for grinding. So that's what the adult mouth looks like in each quadrant. You have two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and three molars. Realize, of course, that third molar is your wisdom tooth. So if you've had your wisdom teeth pulled, or if you were lucky enough like me, um, where you didn't um, inherit them because that actually is something that can get, get passed on, then you would only have two molars. Now, as far as baby teeth go, there are only 20 of them because obviously in baby teeth, you never have a wisdom tooth, so you only have two molars. But they also don't have any premolars. You only get one set of premolars. They come in around middle school age, so hopefully by then you've learned how to brush your teeth and floss. And so that one set of premolars is going to last you your whole life. Looking at a tooth structure, there are different areas. You may know some of this terminology from before. The exposed part of the tooth above the gum line is called the crown of the tooth. And then the portion that's below the gum and goes into the alveolar ridges of either the maxilla or the mandible, that is called the root. And connecting the root to the bone, there are periodontal ligaments, which basically are ligamentous attachments um, attaching to the periosteum of your jawbone. And it penetrates both into the tooth and into the bone to give us that gum fosis we learned about when we learned about articulation. Making a slice through a tooth, we're going to move now to which type of tooth is this one? That's right, this one's the molar, okay? And we're gonna talk about the structure of the tooth because right now the only thing the students tend to know about is, oh, I've got some enamel, okay? So we're gonna learn more than just enamel. The main bulk of a tooth, the stuff that is this yellowish material here is because it's yellowish in real life and this is called the dentin. So the majority of the tooth is made of dentin, which is heavily calcified cellular material. So it is alive, okay? It's hard like bone, it is not bone, but it's hard and cellular as bone is hard and cellular, okay? So if you've ever learned that the enamel is hard and the tooth is soft, you learned it incorrectly. Covering the dentin in the crown on the exposed area, that's where you find enamel. This is not cellular, which means once it has been produced, and it's produced before the tooth reaches the gum line, so it's produced when the teeth are still in the maxilla and the mandible before they have erupted. Once it is produced, it will never be replaced. So if you have some kind of accident or injury and you scrape the enamel off, you will never have enamel in that place. So that covers the crown. But if you look at this picture, you also can see that there is a skinny white layer that covers the root part of the tooth, and that is called the cementum. 
Now, as opposed to the enamel, which is acellular, meaning it doesn't have cells and it dies, the cementum actually is cellular. It's another layer of calcified cellular matrix. And the last part I want to talk about is this space in the middle of the dentin. And this space is in the main part of the tooth is called the pulp cavity. And then going down in each of the roots is called the root canal. And this is normally filled with loose or or connective tissue and nerves and blood vessels and some lymphatics. So when you get a cavity, what happens is the acids in your bacteria in your mouth will, will go through the enamel and then that can be replaced with either a silver amalgam or something else. If you've heard of people that need root canals, what, what the periodontist has to do is he has to make a hole through the enamel and the dentin to go and remove all the pulp and remove everything from the root canal itself, which means from that point on, there's no nerve in there. And then they pack it with radio opaque stuff so that you can see it's completely filled and there's no air or nothing in there. And then they replace the top with either a white or a silver covering, just like they were um, filling in the site of a cavity. Um, and basically what that means, you can't have pain anymore from that tooth because it's not innervated anymore. All right, now that we're done with the teeth, let's talk about salivary glands. And this is interesting. What you didn't know is that we have three sets of salivary glands. So we have three on the right and three on the left. So starting with the biggest, just anterior to the ear, sitting superficial to the masseter muscle, and you usually can kind of feel it on your, so like find the middle part of your ear and the bottom half, you can kind of feel it's a soft and squishy thing. That's called your parotid gland, and it has a very watery secretion. And it's innervated by the glossal pharyngeal nerve. There is a very distinct Distinct parotid duct, which is here in green, and where it opens is opposite your second molar. So if you don't have your wisdom teeth, you can kind of pull your mouth open, you can squish on your parotid gland, and you can see watery fluid coming out there. Or else you can just look on YouTube because there's lots of tricks people can secrete from their salivary glands on YouTube. For the next salivary gland, go down to the angle of the jaw and then just on the deep surface, so on the inside of the angle of the jaw where the ramus of your mandible is, this is where you would find the submandibular gland. And as opposed to the parotid, which is watery secretion coming from the submandibular gland, this is very thick mucusy stuff and it's secreted or stimulated by the facial nerve. You can find the ducts for this as well. If you lift up your tongue and you find your frenulum in the midline, oftentimes you can see these two ridges right on each side. And those are the ducts for this. And then the openings will be right here at the front end. The anterior aspect is where that is. And that kind of explains why it's very common to have a lot of plaque build up right here on the back of your bottom teeth. And the parotid gland opening opposite your your upper molars explains why you get a lot of plaque up there as well. So the third set of salivary glands go anterior from your submandibular glands and then go towards the midline. So you are directly underneath your tongue and that's where you would find the sublingual gland. And this has both a watery and mucous secretion and once again, it's the facial nerve. So number one here is, is pointing out the frenulum. The blue arrows are pointing out the openings of the submandibular gland. And in the dotted yellow areas, what you will notice if you go back up to the cartoon drawing on the upper right is the sublingual gland doesn't have one duct. It has a whole bunch of little tiny ducts. And so this dotted area is showing where all the little tiny openings would be. So that's it for the glands. So let's learn a little bit about what's in saliva besides just watery and mucusy stuff. So all together, your salivary glands will produce somewhere between a liter and a liter and a half of water a day. So two to three of these water bottles a day. So yes, what normally happens is you swallow all of this and this all enters your digestive system. 
So 99% of that is going to be water, which moistens the food, making it easier to swallow and move along the pathway. There will be mucus, which helps lubricate the food and actually helps cleanse your mouth. The mucus is a good thing. And then there are three other very specific um, things that are found in saliva. The first is a chemical known as amylase. And this molecule is an enzyme. So anytime you see a word that ends with ace, that is an enzyme. So amylase is an enzyme that starts digesting carbohydrates. So while you have carbohydrates in your mouth and the saliva is coating them, you are going to start digesting that. And so if you are, go to a Christian church or a Catholic church where you get the host and you put it on your tongue and you suck on it, I think you can realize that it kind of dissolves over time and it dissolves a lot faster than if you took that and you put it in just water because of your amylase in your saliva. Now, because saliva secretions is going to carry a fair amount of IgA, the secretory immunoglobulin. So yes, when you're kissing and swapping spit, you are, if you have some kind of infection to which you've made this antibody to, you are then not only sharing your germs, you are sharing your antibodies with your loved one. And the third thing is something called lysozyme, which is an enzyme that helps keep the bacterial growth down. So all of these things are super important and if people don't have saliva then you're much more likely to have caries, to have cavities in your teeth. So now that brings us to mastication. Don't forget, whoops, don't forget these two muscles were the muscles of mastication we learned about in the head and neck. They both elevated the mandible for closing the jaw and they both were innervated by which cranial nerve? Yeah, that's right, D3, the mandibular nerve. So this is where mechanical digestion starts as well as the chemical digestion from the amylase in your saliva. So after we have ingested, while it's still in the mouth, we are into digestion, both mechanical and chemical. And then we have to move that food stuff along. So the saliva is going to soften it and kind of make it into a soft little ball ready to swallow. And that is called a bolus of food. And what happens here in your mouth, there's the hard palate, there's the soft palate, here's the uvula. The uvula raises up to close the opening between the back of the oral cavity and the back of the nasal cavity. So, so that food cannot go up into what's called the nasal pharynx. And then inferiorly, the piece of cartilage going into your larynx covers the opening so food cannot go down into your airway. And so this process of swallowing is going to start voluntary and it's going to end up involuntary. So let me show you how that happens in a little bit more detail. Here we have the green food bolus, the uvula is hanging down. It's going to flip up and close this. This piece of cartilage is going to flip down and close that. So the oral phase is very voluntary because you know we can sit here and I can go swallow. And we all can swallow. And so because it's voluntary, we know which cranial nerves it's going to be because we know what these muscles are. So yes, D3, yes, the hypoglossal, and yes, the facial nerve. So stop when I'm saying yes, yes, and yes. Stop and think what exactly have I talked about that these nerves are moving so that you understand this process. Don't just memorize it. Put all, all the pieces together. After this, we're gonna move into our pharynx, which is the back of the throat, and this is where it becomes involuntary. We can no longer stop it. The food is blocked from going up where it's blocked from going down into our airway. We actually automatically stop breathing. Our vocal cords have closed, and so the food bolus is being pushed back posteriorly, and this is going to involve two cranial nerves, the glossopharyngeal and the vagus. After that, we're going to be in our food tube, the esophagus, and this is voluntary. Now we are below the level of the throat and everything below the level of the throat, everything from now on is going to be vagus nerve. If this is food, it's going to take about five or 10 seconds to move its way down below the diaphragm into our abdominal cavity. If it's liquid, it only takes a couple seconds. In other words, it's not nearly as fast as standing at a well and, and just go flop 
in a portion of a second. Because here we have muscles and the esophagus is normally collapsed down on itself. And so it has to have alternate relaxation and contraction going on this process known as peristalsis. And if you don't believe that, have you ever had food where you can feel that it's stuck part way down? Yeah, it's because that smooth muscle is contracted and it's not doing peristalsis. But if you just wait a second, give it a chance to relax and it'll continue on its way. So with that, we are done with this section, and I will see you as we continue this pathway, and we are going to the esophagus next. Thank you for all your hard work, and I hope you're enjoying the digestive system.